Can you hear me? There we go. All right. Sorry about that. We're grateful that you're here with us this morning to worship and uh, a special service this morning in several ways. It is Easter Sunday morning and the Lord is risen. Do you mean it? Amen. And the second special thing is we have Maranatha Bible School Choir here with us, and I know that's why a lot of you visitors are here, so welcome to this Sunday morning uh, worship time. I thought I would just read a few verses out of Hebrews. I was contemplating our Lord's death and resurrection, and Hebrews is always uh, inspiring to me when Christ is is compared with um, high priests of the earthly sense and the tabernacle of the earthly sense. And in Hebrews chapter 9, we have the Hebrew writer talking about Jesus being a perfect high priest and how that the high priests and the worship in the tabernacle and the sacrifices would only um, cleanse and purify in a fleshly kind of way. But Christ cleanses and purifies the conscience. And um, so I'm going to read verse 11 of chapter 9 of Hebrews. It says, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of of the eternal, eternal inheritance. And so brothers and sisters this morning, that's what we commemorate is the death, and burial, and the resurrection of Christ unto new life in him. And so I would just invite you to contemplate that as we worship together this morning. I would like to have a word of prayer, and then our song leader will come up and lead us in two congregational songs, and after that the choir will come in, and they will sing the first half of their program, and then Brother Glenn Horst will preach a message for us. Glenn has been uh, the tour director, has also been involved at Maranatha Bible School for a number of years as the principal there, and he is also a minister of the gospel, so he will be preaching for us this morning. Um, after that, the, uh, when he's done, then we'll come up and we'll take an offering for the, for the um, chorus, and then they will finish the second half. All right, let's pray, and then Brother Brent, you can come up and lead us in songs. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, this morning we bow in your presence. We are so grateful for your mercy and your love, your goodness and kindness to us. And we recognize, Father, that we certainly didn't deserve it. But you did. You willingly went to the cross. Your son did. And we're grateful. So this morning, Father, as we listen to the songs that are being sung, would you draw our hearts towards worship and adoration for what you've done? Help us to turn our eyes, our spiritual minds, and our hearts towards you this morning. We commit the entire service to you. And we'll give you honor and glory for all things that are done here. In Jesus' name, amen.
Brother Brandt. I want to say good morning to all of you. If you take your hymns of the church and turn to song number 248. Song number 248.
Ancient words, Lord, preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength.
about ancient words, ever true is the last words we said there. Um, we come to you this morning not with anything new or anything you haven't heard before. We're just repeating those same ancient words over and over, and that's the beauty of the scriptures, that we can be encouraged through it. Um, God has a way of bringing things out to us that we hadn't thought about before or being encouraged before, and so we're happy to be here. We appreciate all you've done for us so far, and our desire is that you can not focus on us this morning, but you can worship with us. This is our last program, so we're kind of mentally going through these one last time. You, some of you know what that's like. Um, and yeah, so. but our next song is I'll Praise My Maker. It's a familiar song. We invite you to sing with us. It's 101 in the hymns of the church. And we sing the men on verse 2 and the ladies on verse 3 together on the first and last verse. So sing with us, please. I'll Praise My Maker.
thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock, for an house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul in adversities, and hast not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set my feet in a large room. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies, and from them that persecute me. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sake. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee. Let the wicked be ashamed, and let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. O oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid out for them that fear thee which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful, and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. <coughs>
next song is called Meditations of My Heart. And this last song just talked about um, blessed are those who love the Lord. Um, it's just a challenge to me that um, if, if we're willing to give up ourselves and, and let God rule in our lives and, and focus and meditate on Him instead of the things that we want in our own lives, um, yeah, if we, if we let those meditations in our life, they will change us. shared in our humanity so that by his death he might defeat 
the dreadful one who holds the power of death. He has freed us all from slavery, for we all have lived our lives in fear, the gripping fear of suffering and death. Was made like us in every way, he suffered death, my debt to pay, the glory of the sun will shine forever. He is risen, he is risen, 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 risen from the grave. See his glory, glory, it will never fade away. When we say we see on that resurrection day, we will see the death of death. We will see the death. Son of man, you care for him. All things have been laid underneath his feet. For the one who makes men holy and the ones who are made holy are all part of the family of God. Was made like us in every way. He suffered death, my death to pay. The glory of the sun will shine forever. Greetings to you all in the name of our risen Savior. What a blessing to be together on this wonderful Easter morning. We are a blessed people to serve a risen Savior. The title this morning for the message is, He is Risen to Live in You. Before I get into the thoughts specifically about that title, though, I would like to establish just a few facts that the scriptures bring out so clearly and which magnify the powerful truth and the message that he has risen. So if you would turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 19. This is a story you know well the story of Jesus' crucifixion and then ultimately his resurrection. There's always the risk when we know these stories well that we miss some of the most important details or the important truths that are here. And the word of God is so powerful and rich. There's details here in these stories that if you were making it up, if you were creating this narrative, if you were trying to create this hero Jesus, you'd never write it the way it's written. And that's what makes it so powerful and so beautiful. 
The first thing I want to notice is rather obvious, but I think it's important that we identify it again. Jesus is very dead here after the crucifixion. Picking up at verse 16 of John 19. Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in, in the Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one, and Jesus in the midst. Drop down to verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my garment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. And then drop down to verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it, in, it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Crucifixion was highly effective in that time. It was a gruesome, horrendous way to die. I don't want to get too gruesome this morning, but the body would just fatigue and fatigue and fatigue until it could no longer fight for life. And when a victim, just like Jesus, was nailed to the cross through his wrists and through his feet, the pain of that would cause the muscles to spasm and contract and get weaker and weaker, and you would hang down on this hewn, rugged, wooden cross with the back shredded by scourging previously. And then for every breath, you literally had to pull on those nails with your arms and push on those nails with your feet and gasp another breath into your lungs. And then as you hung there, the air would be expelled until you could not, the body just needed oxygen again, and you would do this over and over again, once or twice a minute. And typically, a victim of crucifixion would hang upon the cross for 24 hours or more before the body would finally die. Now, in this particular case, the Jews, we find in verse 31, were quite concerned that we wouldn't have any Jewish victims of crucifixion. After all, it was the Jews that had pushed to have these men put to death. And they didn't want them hanging on the cross on the Sabbath. And it's almost comical to think about that after all the mockery of a trial they just had and all the ways that they had violated the will of God and the righteous judgments of God, that they were concerned that, well, we don't want someone dying on the Sabbath. So they asked to have the soldiers sent. I'll read here from verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was a preparation, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day is a high or a holy day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers which with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. 
For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. When the Roman soldiers came to Jesus, they looked on him. And because Jesus had given up the ghost and gave his life, there was no life in him. And they could see that he was already dead. But just to confirm and to verify that there can't be life in him anymore, and to accomplish with certainty what their duty was to make sure he died on the cross, one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced his side. Probably jabbed in on an angle because Jesus would have been elevated slightly up underneath the rib cage and into the chest cavity where his heart would be and his lungs. And the Bible says, and this is an important little detail, that blood and water came pouring out. Now when a person dies, I'm not a doctor, and some of you could probably explain this better, but some things happen very quickly in the body. Blood begins to pool in all of the lower extremities and in the cavity where the heart is. Water pools there as well, separates. There's no water there when a person is living. In fact, that's a problem if you have fluid around your heart. But once you die, there is fluid and water sitting there in the chest cavity. And this soldier's spear pierced that cavity and that blood and water that's recorded flowing out is again proof that Jesus is very dead. There are some today that would like to pretend or imagine that, well, maybe Jesus didn't really die. Maybe his resurrection is just a ruse or somehow we are tricked into believing that he rose and he was never actually dead. These little details in the scripture make it so clear. The Roman soldiers knew what a victim looked like that was dead on the cross. And when they came to him, they looked on him and they knew that they didn't need to break his legs. You know what happened when they broke their legs? They could no longer pull themselves up or push themselves up for another breath. And within a few moments, they would suffocate to death. They didn't need to do that with Jesus because they knew he was dead. And then just to verify with all certainty, they pierced his side and outflowed blood and water. The second thing I want you to notice this morning in an intro here is that Jesus is buried. In verse 38 it says, After this Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate, that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And they took, then took they, the body of Jesus, and wound it in linen cloths with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So they take Jesus' body, two secret followers of Jesus from high Jewish rank, part of the Sanhedrin most likely. They beg beg Pilate for his body, he gives him gives it to them, and they take it and they wrap it in linens, little strips of cloth wrapped around the body, the dead body of Jesus, after they would have washed it down and cleaned it up. And they put on it spices and and myrrh, it says, and different scents to overpower the smell of the dead body as it began to decay, keep it as presentable as possible, to treat it with dignity. And it says it was a hundred pound weight, That's about 75 pounds to us today of spices. And Jesus' body would have been wrapped again and again and again and again in these strips of cloth. And then he was laid there in the tomb, probably also on some spices and myrrh that would have been there on the stone where he was laid. And that's where his body was put. He was buried. He was laid there to rest, dead, in a cold, dark tomb. Thirdly, I want you to notice with me back in the book of Matthew, verse chapter 27. 
the end of chapter 27, in verse 62, I want you to notice that the tomb is sealed. It says, now the next day, the fo- following the day of the preparation, that would have been the Sabbath day, it wasn't okay to have people hanging on a cross, but it was important to get a guard set around this tomb on the Sabbath day. Again, the ironies we see here. The chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, after he was yet, well, sorry, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Let me just pause there for a moment. What was their actual fear here? You ever stop to think about that? You know how timid and fearful and scattered the disciples were? There was zero risk that they were coming anywhere near that tomb to steal Jesus' body. I believe they actually were afraid that Jesus would rise from the dead. And somehow in their twisted minds, they thought they could keep him there in the tomb if they sealed him in. I don't know how tightly that tomb was sealed. It's quite possible that there was no actual oxygen exchange after they sealed the tomb. And maybe they believed that even if somehow he was still alive, or if he rose, if he was trapped in there, he would die again. I I don't know what they all thought. But I know that they were probably more concerned that he would actually rise than that they were concerned that the disciples would steal his body. And Pilate said unto them, You have a watch. Go your way. And and this phrase just captivates my imagination. Make it as sure as you can. Make that tomb as sure as you can. I wonder, too, what Pilate thought. Remember in the trial, Pilate was concerned about who is this Jesus? Where is he really from? Are you the son of God? Where do you come from? Are you a king? All these things that Pilate asked him. And his wife had a dream about Jesus, and he wanted nothing to do with the death of Jesus. I wonder what Pilate thought. I wonder if he just thought this was foolishness to trap a dead body with a guard or whether he too considered that it was possible that Jesus would rise again. Make it as sure as you can. And they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. I don't know exactly what that watch was, but many commentators would suggest it was a group of at least 16 soldiers that on the penalty of death were responsible to ensure that that body remained in that tomb. Why is this detail important? Well, do you believe the disciples stole the body with a Roman guard, sealed tomb? I don't. It just again magnifies the authority of the scriptures that the body of Jesus was dead, it was buried, and it was sealed in a tomb. One more thing I want you to think about here before we get into the message is the despair of the disciples. This was a dark day. Not today, but yesterday. As the disciples considered what had happened to their Messiah, he was crucified. They watched him die from the distance, from the backs of the crowd. It's interesting that we don't read anything about the disciples except when Peter denied him and they all scattered. And then other than a few little instances with John, the disciple he loved, and their mother there on the, or Jesus' mother on the cross, you don't read anything about the disciples. It wasn't the disciples that came and asked Pilate for the body and wanted to bury it properly. They were, they were in deep, deep despair. And you can understand that because here was their Messiah, the one they had their hopes in, even in what Judas did after he betrayed him. There's no way they considered that it was possible that Jesus would actually die on the cross. They were sure he would save himself as he had always done before. But they watched him die. And it was a dark, dark day, utter hopelessness. 
They were broken in every way, without strength, disillusioned, in deep despair. It's no wonder to me that they went to Jerusalem and locked the doors. And again, why is that important? They didn't steal the body, my friends. They were broken. They were men of absolute hopelessness. And we'll see that further in a few moments. Today, in that day, sorry, yesterday, darkness had triumphed. Christ was dead. And this is a stage, then, that we begin to read again in John chapter 20. Turn back there with me. John 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Now we could go to the other Gospels and see that the Lord, in his power by the angels, had already moved the stone. Not to let Jesus out, don't get that mixed up in your mind, but to let the disciples in to see what had taken place. And Mary, in this account, simply comes there and sees the stone moved and turns around and runs back to tell the disciples. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together. The other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. Let me just stop here again and invite you to imagine what thoughts must have been running through these two men's minds. As they're running to this tomb where their Messiah was dead and had been buried. I wonder how many things were going through their minds about what Jesus had told them. The excitement and yet despair and almost an uneasiness, hardly knowing if could they possibly believe that Jesus would be risen? Was that possible? I can imagine their minds were racing in every way as they raced in their feet to the tomb. And when John, the disciple there, is talking about came to the tomb, it says in verse 5, he stooped down and looked in and saw the linen cloths lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen cloths lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. So John runs up to the sepulcher, to the tomb. He stops at the entrance, and he looks in. And he sees these grave clothes. And he stops, and he's looking, and Peter huffing and puffing along behind. But Peter, being what he is, just charges right on into the tomb. And he looks, and he too sees these grave clothes. These linen wraps that had been around and around and around Jesus' body. And it says that they looked and they believed. And this is why it's so important we understand how he was buried. Because there on the stone where Jesus' body had been, laid this empty cocoon of grave clothes, wrapped in a perfect cocoon still, undisturbed but empty Now, there's no possible way for anyone to get out of those without untangling them unless something supernatural happened. And something supernatural did happen. Christ rose from the dead. He simply left that cocoon of grave clothes and he stood up, I can imagine, and he took off the the napkin on his head and set it aside and there it was, all the evidence the disciples ever needed to know that their Lord Jesus Christ had risen. Empty cocoon of grave clothes. And it says they saw and believed. And then it says something very interesting in verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. 
John is just acknowledging that they didn't understand what was happening here. They didn't understand why Jesus needed to rise. It became clear when the Holy Spirit came to them, but at this point, they couldn't fathom the idea of a resurrection. They couldn't understand what all God was doing, but there it was before their eyes, and they believed. Then the disciples went again, away again into the home, their own home. Two things this morning I'd like to notice about the resurrection. First, the prominence of the resurrection. My friends, this is the most important fact about the Christian faith. There is nothing more important to the Christian faith. You see, if anyone could ever disprove that Jesus rose from the dead, then Christianity is a total hoax. Do you understand that? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then he's just another man, and in fact, he's, a, he's a, a bad man because he lied to us in so many ways. But because of Jesus' resurrection, that pinnacle of the gospel, it is this truth that Jesus rose from the dead is absolutely critical to our faith. It is the most important thing about Christianity, and it is the one thing that sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. Our Master, our Lord, is risen. The others are all still in the tomb. None of the others came out of their grave clothes. In fact, our religion is a resurrection religion. We believe in a new life, a new birth, a new home, a new hope. Why? All of those things because of a resurrection of our Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, If Christ be not risen, our faith is vain, and our preaching is also vain. We are totally wasting our time this morning if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. We might as well be golfing or doing something else. But Jesus did rise from the dead. I want to think quickly about three things that it proves, the resurrection proves, the why it's so important. First of all, it validates the words of Jesus. Jesus said over and over again to his disciples that on the third day after I am crucified, I am going to rise again. And if Jesus didn't rise, then he lied all those times. And his words in every other place where he talks about, come unto me and I will give you rest, where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, where he says, I am the true bread, the living bread that came down from the Father, all those words are empty and dead unless he rose from the dead. But because he did rise from the dead, those words have power and authority and truth and hope and life and everything that we need for us. So the resurrection validates the words of Christ. Secondly, it demonstrates the acceptance of the blood sacrifice. Brother Lyle in the opening read some words there about blood sacrifices. Jesus Christ came to this world to be the one final blood sacrifice for sin. When John the Baptist saw him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus went to the cross with the belief that he was that perfect sacrifice that God had sent. And he hung on the cross and shed his blood willingly because he believed that his blood was exactly what you needed so that you could be forgiven. And I don't know, this is just my imagination, so take it for what it's worth, but I can imagine all of heaven on the edge of their seats on resurrection morning. Was the sacrifice good enough? Did it meet the need? Did it do what it needed to do so that mankind could be redeemed and washed? Sin could be permanently washed in the blood of the Lamb? Was it enough? When they said at the day of the crucifixion there at the cross, they said, come down from the cross, or why won't Elijah come and get you down from the cross if he will have him, talking about God. Will God have this sacrifice of Jesus Christ? And when Jesus rose from the dead... It validated, it absolutely emphasized and demonstrated perfectly that God accepts the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, the shed blood of Jesus for your forgiveness. Without the resurrection, that blood wouldn't have the power it has. 
but because he rose, we know that God accepts that final sacrifice, the last blood to be shed for sin, Jesus' perfect blood. And thirdly, it proves his victory over death. The chorus just sang a song, The Death of Death. There's a day coming where we'll have another resurrection. All of us will be ri- rising to eternal life if we're in the, in the Lord Jesus. And why is that possible? Because on that day, Jesus Christ, by his resurrection, brought a fatal, permanent, deadly blow against the devil and against death. He had victory over death. He came out of death. He rose again. He lives again. I won't take the time this morning, but you could read in 1 Peter 1. It's this lively hope that God has given us. And how do we have this lively hope? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There will be a future resurrection. Death cannot hold. Couldn't hold Jesus. It cannot hold you. Because if you are in Christ, you cannot die. You will rise again. So the prominence of the resurrection. Secondly, this morning, I want to think about the power of the resurrection. And I'm not thinking about the power that it took to rise Jesus from the dead. That is a tremendous power. uh, One we can't even imagine. I remember years ago trying to illustrate to my children when my boys were young, really young. I remember holding a little dead animal in my hands and asking them, what do you think it would take to have that animal come back to life? And, of course, we, there's nothing, absolutely nothing we could do to bring it back to life. But God has the power to rise his son, to raise his son to life again. And I remember one of my little boys looking at me and saying, well, how much power does it take? Do you know? I don't know. But I know it's in the power that God has to raise him to new life. I'm not thinking about the physical resurrection today. I'm not thinking about our future resurrection. But I am thinking about the power of the resurrection in your life today. Jesus lives. He rose again to live in you. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. This resurrection truth, the The reality that Jesus lives is not just something that happened in the past. And it's not just something that will happen in the future when the resurrection happens. It's something that is present with us today. And it's an experience that every Christian should have on a daily basis. Romans 6, beginning to read at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is it right, is it truthful, is it proper that a Christian would continue in sin? That's the question Paul's asking. It says in verse 2, God forbid. Now that's as emphatic a no as you can find in the scripture. God forbid. That's not how it ought to be. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verse 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Why did that happen? Why are we baptized into death? Why do we experience this death? Here it says that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall, not we might, not we could, not some of us will, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. My friends, this morning, we as Christians have absolutely no excuse to live under the burden of sin. We have no excuse to live in sin. We have no excuse to be practicing sin because the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is in you if you are in Christ. And that power, the resurrection power, is to bring you up out of sin, to live above sin, free from sin, and over in victory of sin. Verse 6. Knowing this, this is what happened by this resurrection. 
by your new birth, by the death of you and the resurrection of you because of the resurrection of Christ, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. I don't believe this morning that that means that you will never sin or that you can't sin or that it's impossible for the Christian to walk, to fall into sin. It's not that. What it does mean is that the power, the gripping power of sin, the uncontrollable urge to sin, the inability of you to overcome sin, that is all put to death and you are given this resurrection power to live above sin. That's what it means. The desire, the, the control of sin, the, the push to sin without the, without the power to overcome it, that body of sin is put to death. And you have the ability in Christ to not serve sin. Then it goes on again in verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, Death hath no more dominion over him. That's obvious. Of course we understand that. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now here's an important word. Likewise. What does that mean? Same experience for you. Just as Christ died once and then rose to live above and in victory, we also are called, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. If you, my friends, have been born again, don't keep on yielding your members to sin, but yield them in righteousness unto God by the power of the resurrection to live as holy vessels until he calls us home. Let me just read a few other verses here that emphasize this thought. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11. You can turn, if you will, with me. Romans 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he just spent the previous verses telling us that's the case, that's true, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also, here's the same power again, the same resurrection power, shall also quicken your mortal bodies as their physical bodies where we live today by his spirit that dwelleth in you. That resurrection power to overcome sin and to bring you above sin is in you. 2 Corinthians verse chapter 13. Second Corinthians 13 verse 4. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God, because God raised him from the dead. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Again, we have the power of God in us. And one more verse, or a couple of verses in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. What power? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And we could read on into chapter 2 and it describes how this happened for us, that we were brought to new birth because of faith in Christ and we experienced the resurrection power in our lives. Again, I want to make it crystal clear to you this morning. The gospel message is clear throughout the scriptures that the resurrection power is there 
today to give us power to live above sin. And I'm going to say again, we have no excuse, brothers and sisters, not one excuse to live in defeat. Whatever sin you are struggling with, as we say, whatever sin you're being overcome by, there is no excuse. The power of the resurrection is available to the believer. If you will be dead in Christ, if you will die to self and die to your flesh, then you will be risen with Christ to sit in heavenly places above and without act of sin in your life. In closing, I want to look at Philippians chapter 3. Verses 9 to 11. Could make a whole message here. I'm not going to do that, but we have a sandwich here. In verse 9, we have a tremendous promise where he talks about being found in him, in Christ, not having his own righteousness. In the previous part of the chapter, Paul talked about how all the things that he had accomplished in the law and in his, in his Jewish heritage and so on were nothing but dung. But he had this powerful faith in Christ, which brought about the righteousness of God. He was righteous because he believed. You can study that in Romans chapter 4 and understand what it means. Jesus, God the Father, recognizes our faith in Jesus Christ as righteousness, and by that we are made righteous and declared righteous before him. And then in verse 11, the other, half, the other side of the sandwich, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. There Paul is looking future to the resurrection at the end of time where he will be brought finally in full salvation with his Lord Jesus into the permanent resurrection of the dead. And in between, in the center of this sandwich, is our current existence, our current life. And I want you to notice what it says here. And I, there's four powerful things here that we could spend another hour talking about, but I just want to give them to you quickly. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. What is Paul saying in that? He's saying that I'm made righteous by faith and I have a hope of an eternal resurrection. But in the meantime, I'm going to live in this life. And here's how I'm going to live. He says, first of all, I'm going to live to know him. I want to know Jesus Christ. I want to know everything about him. I want to pursue him with my entire life. Are we doing that? Or do we just sit here on Easter Sunday and celebrate that Jesus is risen? Or do we actually pursue him as we ought, as the Lord of creation, the one and only God who rose from the dead? Are you pursuing a relationship with him so that you can know him? Do you know his words? Do you know him, his person of what he was like? Have you continually studied the scriptures to know who Jesus is? And don't go out there somewhere on a boat or in a field or back in the woods and try to meditate uh, on what is out there and try to empty your mind. That's not how you get close to Christ. You know how you get close to Christ? Right here. The only way we know anything about Jesus is from the Word of God. You can never be closer to Christ. You can never know Him better than when you're reading your Bible. Secondly, he says the power of his resurrection. He wants to know that. He wants to experience it. And that is just what we've been talking about, this power that is in us to live above sin. But he says two things further that are critically important for us. He, he says, Paul says, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Now in the second half of the program this morning, the chorus is going to sing a few songs about the reality of life. And how there are times where we face hard things. We go through difficult circumstances. And God allows that to happen in our lives. Whether that is through sickness. Whether that is through relationship struggles. Whether that is through trial because of financial burdens. Whatever it is. Some things we bring on ourselves. Some things just come upon us because of circumstances around us. But this is the suffering of Christ that we are going to experience. Don't expect as a Christian to live an easy life. It's not going to happen. You're going to experience the fellowship of his sufferings. And then he says what is the most important thing for us of all, being made conformable unto his death. Brothers and sisters, this morning, the reason we fall into sin, the reason we struggle so much with difficulties in our lives is because we cannot and do not give up ourselves. Will you die to yourself? Is it okay for God to do just whatever he wants with your life? 
Can you lay yourself down on the altar and be there willingly, giving up of yourself and your goals and your dreams and your pursuits and your hopes and what you thought your life should be like and simply accept that when I die, when I am weak, then I am strong. When I die to myself and to my flesh, then I can truly experience the power of the resurrection. And then I have the surety of the hope of a future resurrection. Brothers and sisters, this power of the resurrection is for us today. And are you experiencing it? Jesus Christ is risen. He wants to be risen in you. Are you experiencing that? I invite you to stand with me for prayer. Our Holy Father, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus. And Lord, on this resurrection morning, we have so much hope, so much joy, so much to be thankful for. Lord, we are so unworthy, and yet you gave your son, and then you raised him to life again to prove that you accepted him, and that we have the ability then to be forgiven in him. But Father, this morning, help us to remember this is not just a historical event or a future event of a future resurrection, but you rose, your son rose, so that we can experience the resurrection power in our lives today as we walk in our lives in the coming week, as we face trials and temptations and struggles in this life. Your resurrection power is there for us. Help us to claim that and to die to self so we can truly experience it. Lord, we have no excuse, although we make many, for living in sin. Your power, the same power that lifted Jesus to new life, again, is available to each one here if we will but trust you and enable that power in our lives. Father, we ask for your continued presence with the service this morning. As we continue to worship you, may you receive all honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Brother Glenn, for sharing a powerful message on resurrection. I was reminded of Galatians 2.20. It says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I wonder sometimes if I really do want to know him. because it's not easy to die. It's hard to be crucified. And then I wonder if I really believe in the power of the resurrection. That, my friends, brothers and sisters, is evident in the life we live. And so I was challenged this morning, brother. Thank you for preaching. The food committee, by the way, we are having brunch after the service, and everyone is welcome, but the food committee was wondering how many are actually going to stay. They kind of like to have a count. So if you could raise your hand high. You're welcome to stay. They just kind of want to get a count. So raise your hands high if you're going to stay. The ushers, keep them up. It's going to take a little bit to count everything.
okay. Thank you. I think they have a general idea. Thank you for doing that. At this point, we'd like to take an offering for the chorus, so I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward with the offering baskets, and we'll take up that offering. So if the ushers want to come forward, we'll have a word of prayer over the offering, and then uh, maybe while the offering's being lifted, Brother Brent, you can come forward and lead us in a song while the offering is being taken. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we heard truth this morning, both in the songs that were sung and also in the message, and we're grateful for truth because it directs our lives. Father, you've been kind and gracious to us, and you've allowed us to have jobs, and now we want to give back to your work. And so as we give financially, would you bless the offering? Would you bless Maranatha Bible School as they use the funds for your kingdom's sake? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Brent.
This next song we're going to sing is called Try God. It's not just an option to try God, but it is a command. And when we do try God, he will make a dramatic difference in your lives. Along with that, it's kind of like a totally different thought, but I thought about it um, when we were singing in Dublin. There's a phrase in that song that says, and by his grace, I am heaven bound. And like, yeah, by his grace, I grew up um, in my net home and stuff and am not one of those people in Dublin. And yeah, I'm just so thankful. sharing um, what he has done for me with others. May you all 
next song is called I Believe, and I just want to testify to the difference that it makes in our lives, and we believe that God is real, and not only that he is real to other people, but that he's real to me, too, and letting that make a difference in my life, and I'm so thankful that we serve a risen Savior, and that he is personal to each one of us, and that we can believe him even when we don't feel it, and that he is here. Notice the way that uh, the lyrics work in this song. We move from very obvious truths of the physical world around us, the sun shining, to things that are sometimes harder for us to believe. Um, and it's just a testament to the goodness of God um, and how we can how we can see Him in the world around us.
last song reminded me of a time in my life when I listened to that song a lot, um, especially the part about believing God even when he is silent, and how coming through that I realized that God was there in the hard time. And I also had to think of another song that talks about, would we truly long for heaven if our life was perfect here? And this next song um, kind of contrasts to that song we just sang in that it's really joyful and looking forward to heaven. And when we keep that eternal perspective, like um, we can have more trust that God will work things out for our good because there's coming a day when he'll put all tears and pain away. This world is not my home, just I'm just a just a passing through. My treasures are laid out. Oh.
Isaiah chapter 6 in the Old Testament is Isaiah's call. You know, God is there and he says, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. This next God song. is still making that call today to all of us as Christians. And I would just say, I hope that this next song is all our, the testimony of every one of us. This next song we're going to sing is a statement in it that says, We will overcome. And I'd like to tie two other songs that we sang into it. Um, I believe a statement that is um, aside from emotion. I like that song. Um, confidently saying, I believe. And, and when we say, and can confidently say, I believe, we have the promise that we do not walk alone. And then along with that progression, we will overcome. This next song speaks a little bit about that. Leave this next song as a challenge to the choir. We got to go to Ireland and we got to go visit different places and we had many times to witness to other people. And I just want to encourage each one of us to keep being faithful in our witness and also for the rest of you to just be faithful where God has called you and be a faithful witness so that we can all be in heaven together. Amen. If you were blessed with the program and the message this morning, I'm going to invite you, if you have something to share uh, with us, I'm going to invite you to do that right now. Maybe you were blessed and you just want to give a testimony uh, this morning. You can just speak up and give a word of testimony. <laughs> 